Hi everyone, good evening. Welcome to the 15th uh, Janal uh, Talks lecture um, in the series. Um, I'm going to start by giving a slightly longer introduction than we normally give because today is a, a slightly different uh, and special day. Um, the year 2022 marked the 35th year of the Kerala Museum. Um, and to commemorate the milestone, we had approached the Geojit Foundation for support towards a digital platform, um, a program on Kerala's history. The initiative um, kind of paid homage to the museum's creator, Madhavan Nair, and his lasting dream of bringing history within the reach of all. Um, in our pursuits to enhance the educational landscape of Kerala, and this I would also like to add uh, with a nod to the Kerala History Congress that's happening simultaneously to today and tomorrow, um, they started their efforts way back in 2016 to create uh, 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 an environment for students and researchers to start writing and thinking and discussing Kerala history in different ways, new ways. And thanks to Kerala History Congress uh, General Secretary Sebastian Joseph, um, uh, we have our speaker Ashok uh, Rangarajan here with us today, Mahesh Rangarajan here with us today. Um, so in our pursuits to enhance the educational landscape of Kerala uh, and create this kind of interactive platform that fosters exchange between disciplines and not only within history, um, we ventured beyond the physical confines of the museum to try and look at um, a history that can be, uh, can reach people on their devices in their homes, but also bring people physically to the museum uh, so that we can have these discussions and talks and explorations of new areas and new approaches to history. So Janal, meaning window in Malayalam, um, seeks to craft digital exhibitions that allow you to explore Kerala history in new ways. Um, so far, we've looked at Kerala history presented in the form of books, in the form of papers, but the journal exhibitions bring it to you with pictures and with storytelling, and with, which allows you to kind of browse through the topic in a non-linear format. Um, the canvas is called the journal archive, and we explore micro histories. Using those micro histories, we go further and try and interconnect disciplines. Um, one of the things that we started, uh, as per actually uh, George Sir's uh, also brilliant idea, was this journal talks to complement the journal archive. And um, the journal talks, what, what today, what it's become, there are views on YouTube that you know we never actually thought we would have, but it's being used as a resource by students across the country, across the world, actually. Um, and we often get people asking us, when is the next Journal Talks planned? We're subscribed. We want to be able to uh, listen and plug into the next lecture. So we started in July last year, and um, we bring not only academicians, but also practitioners, people who are exploring their topics uh, in new and nuanced ways, uh, exploring history, but an environmental or a cultural, uh, sociological history and not a pure history. Because of which we've had a lot of interesting, um, you know, uh, presentations of uh, various different topics. What makes it even more exciting is that our audience is from a variety of backgrounds. Um, in the Kerala History Congress yesterday, for instance, we found um, it's mostly researchers, it's mostly historians, it's mostly uh, people who are steeped in the subject already. But here we, in our Q&A after our talk, we always end up with some very exciting new connections because of the questions that have come from the audience. And also the speaker is able to engage with a new area or a new, new idea because of those um, questions that come in. So today we'd like to take you uh, for a quick sneak peek into the journal platform online, um, which is, there's a bunch of themes that are already uh, out there and, and ready for you all to browse through. But there's also, we're working on four other themes as well. And we're also opening up the journal archive for people to um, contribute their work as well. 
Um, so we've just created a new logo. Uh, so <laughs> this is what it looks like. And um, Avni will then take us through the website. Uh, Mahesha, we'd love to have you come and just click on one of our uh, exhibitions so that we can formally launch. Yeah, let's hope everything works. <laughs> yeah, so as you can see, these are our exhibitions. Our researchers and our uh, exhibition writers, our editors have been putting together. Sebastian Joseph, a professor who has um, been looking at contemporary history and colonial history, um, is also part of our team as consulting, consulting historian. And he looks at all of our uh, work as well as guides us on how to make the exhibitions better because he himself is very interested in bringing history out in new ways. So from uh, addition of maps to how to tell the story uh, in a more you know, communicative way, uh, he's getting involved in all of that. Um, I was thinking, uh, Avni, maybe the Indo-Norwegian project yeah. Um, so many of you who are from Cochin would have heard of the Indo-Norwegian project. Uh, and Tina sitting there, she's the one who's been uh, researching the topic. So this is what a digital exhibition looks like. It takes you through the why, the how, and where we are today as well. Yeah, we're, we're little, uh, the internet upstairs is a little slower because we're streaming live on. Yeah. So we'll be sharing these links with all the journal talks attendees over the next two, three days so that we can also collect your feedback. And so they'll be in the form of surveys. So after you all have a read, you can please also let us know what you think. Uh, the journal archive center which Avni will show you, uh, that page has also yeah, this page also has got the uh, links to our journal lecture series as well as the articles that have originally been written as research before they are converted to exhibitions. So if someone wants to read only the research on the on that topic, they can actually browse through these articles in these styles and download or view the PDF of that. Yeah, and uh, journal lecture series is very exciting and interesting, very varied, and it's, you know, so um, it's actually something that even yesterday at the History Congress, people said, oh, we've heard of that. We really enjoy listening to those lectures. So it's something that we feel can gather more and more steam as we go along. So that, uh, you know, the, today ours is different. It's not only Kerala, but of course, uh, Mahesh, uh, Professor Rangarajan has got a lot of uh, experience with Kerala as well. So he will be, uh, no, <laughs> with elephants in Kerala, yeah, stories, but, but he will be touching upon. Um, so he said to avoid uh, a long and boring introduction. So um, I'm going to leave it. <laughs> I'm going to not go into the very long part of it. He currently uh, teaches at Ashoka University. He's an environmental historian. Um, he's also served at, uh, the, uh, as assistant editor at The Telegraph in Calcutta, uh, director of the Nehru Memorial Museum and Library in 2011 to 2015, um, and then a short stint at Kriya University. He chaired the Elephant Task Force for the Government of India in 2010 and served on the Forest Advisory Committee uh, 2008 to 2012. Um, a prolific author, he also has works like Fencing the Forest, India's Wildlife History, Nature and Nation, and his expertise in environmental studies combined with media and administrative experience positions him as a leading figure in the confluence of academia, conservation, and public discourse. So we are so happy to have you here with us today, sir. Please come take the podium.
Thank you for a very generous uh, introduction and a warm welcome. I'm uh, especially uh, privileged and honored to be here at the museum because it's uh, at the interface of specialist knowledge and society at large. Uh, this particularly interests me as a student of history because history originated as a branch of literature. There are different kinds of histories and there's a big debate about history from above and history from below. Uh, whether the histories were from above, one can think of bards reciting the glories of rulers, whether they were potentates or kings or merchant princes. Or they were histories from below, where you know accounts are sung of a particular group and how they settled the landscape or lived over there. Histories are useful because they give us a sense of the past. They give us a sense of the present. And every story told by a student of history has a beginning. It also has a middle and an end. And in a sense, how you tell the story has a lot to do with what you're interested in. One of the ideas of looking at India's environmental past is that the environment today is so critical to our present and our future. Uh, no matter where one lives in this vast subcontinent, no one can be unaware that over the last 25 years, or longer perhaps, we are encountering longer and more intense spells of wet weather, of hot weather, and conversely, of cold weather or dry weather. And this is logically linked by scientists to the larger phenom phenomenon of climate change. Climate change in itself is not new. Now, there have been shifts in the climate over centuries. For these shifts not to have happened, we wouldn't be living through the period we all know as the Holocene, which lasts, which has lasted around 12 to 13,000 years. But many of these changes are driven by very important human actions, largely the burning of fossil fuels. And India has been very important in that story. India has been important both as a site and an arena of historical change. And it's also important, of course, today in the world as it is. So the 20th century, the latter half, in the middle of the 20th century, saw the emergence of India as a politically independent entity and nation state. You are aware that we, are, we have celebrated two days ago 75 years of India as a republic. The other, of course, is the emergence of India in economic terms, particularly in the closing years of the 20th century. This, of course, is very significant because if one were to look at the globe and at shares of the economy, the work of Angus Madison, in 1700, India and China accounted for perhaps half the world's economic output. By the mid-20th century, that had shrunk. And in one sense, the rise of China, or the rise of India, is not an upsetting of the world order. It is a reassertion of the kind of world order that existed before European hegemony. This has, of course, a lot of reason for celebration in countries in Asia. But we should also be aware that the India of today has 1.4 billion people. If you do the math, we don't have a 2021 census. We will have it very soon. It got delayed due to COVID, uh, which is again a reminder of the interface of ecology and history. Uh, the COVID-19 virus has been no spread because humans move from one part of the world to the other. I don't know if you know this statistic. I'm always impressed by it. If you count all the people, who get onto a jet plane and off it every day, it's over one billion people. So the very act of getting into a plane and getting off enabled this particular parasite, the COVID virus, to hop into someone's body, hop onto the plane, and get off it and hop onto someone else. It's very disconcerting, but I think it's a reminder of the fact that when we think of the ecological system, we think of plants, animals, birds, fish, and so on and so forth, it includes us, and it includes the ecology of our very own body. This is not something new for us in this part of the world. Just about 100 years ago, in 1918, at the end of the Great War, the so-called Spanish flu claimed a lot of lives, and the bulk of the lives, the 50 million people who died, were in uh, what was then the British Indian Empire. And that particular uh, 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 organism was carried from place to place by ships and it was dispersed by the soldiers who had fought in the Great War. Over a million Indians fought in the Great War, and some of them and others who were coming into the various ports and harbors, we are in one of the very historic port cities, carried that uh, further. 
I think this is a very uh, good point to keep in mind. When we look at history and ecology and how they influence each other, ecology and ecological factors do play a role in shaping human history. This is a very sad moment to think of the people who lost their lives in COVID or lost their lives in the course of the so-called Spanish flu. But the other is that historical interventions also reshape ecologies. Uh, there has been a lot of cause for celebration, and rightly so, about the speed with which the international community came together after COVID in a manner it could not have in the 1920s, an international community of knowledge and of state cooperation of the sort we have in the 21st century did not exist 100 years ago. And the very fine historian David Arnold, writing in a very important collection put together by uh, Vinayak Chaturvedi, pointed out that the scale of human loss of life, regrettable as it was, was held in check by the availability of vaccines, which showed state capacity as well as cooperation. So you can see here that the ecology, biology, history interface. There are many other ways, but one of the most significant ways, I refer to the fact of India being eclipsed in economic terms. One of the other very important changes, since we are looking at the longer view, is that the number of people in India has significantly increased in the last few hundred years. It's a very fine work by Shumit Guha, who did something quite formidable. He looked at a lot of local estimates, added them all up, and tried to ask how many people were there in the area that constituted British India in Mughal times. So in 1600, the, con the subcontinent of South Asia had about 114 million people. That's uh, Uttar Pradesh today has 200 million, so it will give you an idea. But if I put it in uh, density terms, you'll get a better idea. The density of people was far less in 1600 than it would be in 1880. It was around 35 per square kilometer, whereas in 1880, it was around 80 per square kilometer. Today, it's around 450 per square kilometer. Now, one of the interesting features about this subcontinent is, and you're all aware of that, I'm coming from very cold city of Delhi. You will be happy to know you are spared minus uh, zero degrees at night, around 3 a.m., and 10 degrees at 5 in the evening. You feel like going for a walk and you run back inside. But that's unusual. Delhi is part of this huge smog belt which stretches from Lahore to Dhaka. South Asia is, is being unified through pollutants in a manner that it is not unified through politics. You know, Even countries which are at odds with each other, their citizens are coughing and sneezing because of this uh, smog cloud. But uh, the interesting feature about South Asia is that half the land has abundant sunshine, water, and is cultivable. And today, roughly speaking, half the land is under the plough, or if you like, the tractor. This is a very different picture from the India of 1600, where to go by Guha's estimates, there are others who give larger estimates, I'm going by his, only one-fourth of the land was cultivated. So, situation of the early 18th century or the early 17th century was of large areas of grassland, scrub, marshland, and mature tree forest with islands of permanent cultivation. The exact opposite of what it is today, let us say in the early 21st century or the close of the 20th, where you have vast areas of cultivation with islands of metro tree forest. The grassland in particular has shrunk. A very fine work by my distinguished colleague at the National Center for Biological Sciences, Dr. Jayashri Ratnam, has shown us the importance of naming. You know, we think of naming as very important, and we are living not just in India, but in various parts of the world of a period of naming and renaming. Hmm? or extending names, Nam Antaran, the change of a name, Nam Avistar, extending the name. But you know what Ratnam does is to show this applies as much to natural landscapes as to human-made monuments or sites. Many of the British, as you know, set up a very large forest service in the late 19th century. It was the largest forest estate on earth by 1900, something like 600,000 square kilometers. And there were British officers who hunted, studied fauna or flora. One of them will come back in our story was F.W. Champion, the first man to photograph tigers in the wild. In 1925, he published a photograph of tiger in the wild sitting down, not being chased by beaters. But I want to refer to his brother, the less known but equally important, Sir Harry Champion. Harry Champion sat down with an Indian, S.K. Set, and they brought out a book called The Forest Types of India. What Ratnam and her colleagues have done is to look at that book, examine the evidence, and come up with something really interesting. It is 
many parts of India, which were classified as scrub forest, were not forest. What is Africa, they were doing called, believe it or not, savanna. The kind of savanna, grassland, was very different. But there are estimates by John Richards and others that in the late 19th century, one-fifth of what is now India was savanna. It was tree-covered forest. This is not so surprising. Uh, as late as the 1830s, it was possible to organize, believe it or not, lion hunts in Haryana. My colleague in the Ashoka archives, who is now writing a book, Raza Kazmi, has a superb article on the lions of Haryana, in which he describes there were lions in Haryana. They hunted this huge antelope called the Nilgai. They lived in prides when they were pursued by the British. You may be interested to know. You see, our sympathies have changed. They wouldn't have imagined the lions even tried to attack some of the people who were trying to shoot them. But of course, they paid the price, and the lion would vanish in many parts of Haryana and in all of India except the Gir forest by the end of the 19th century. But the very fact you had such large habitats of carnivore as large as the lion going as far west, as uh, far east as Palamo, right to the uh, south, the Narmada, and the cheetah, which was found as British records, which I've examined elsewhere, show as far south as Tirnal Valley, which is roughly around the latitude we are at. You know, there were black bucks and uh, cheetah in Tirnal Valley in the late 19th century, where rewards were being paid out to give them. That landscape has vanished. And a lot of the debate about the cheetah and whether it should or should not be introduced, whether it's being introduced or reintroduced, whether it's African or Indian, should not blind us to the fact that we can't look at India's ecology as unchanging in terms of human cognition. One of the implications of Jai Shri Ratnam's work and others is that just as we value the forest, and over the last 50 years, forests have come to be seen as very important ecosystems because of their ecological services, because of the way they support livelihoods, they're not just seen as an industrial resource, they're not just seen as places which should be converted into farmland or industry. There is a series of laws and executive actions put in place in the last 50 centuries to safeguard the forest. And interestingly, it's in the last 50 years that executive actions, laws, policies, programs were put in place to guard that great denizen of the forest, the tiger. But sometimes actions which have one intention, protecting the forest, saving the tiger, have another intention. Uh, if I can take the analogy further, the tiger, which is quite a large animal, and the forest, which is a large entity, cast a deep shadow. And in that shadow comes all the other habitats and ecological systems, which are as vital as forest. And that would include, of course, the grasslands. And one of the very critical features we know about today's world is that these systems are interconnected. The grassland, the forest, the marsh, the river, the plain, the coast are interconnected. And it is the transformation of those interconnections which would be one of the enduring changes of the uh, British putting down their roots into Indian society. I was thinking of someone all of you would relate to, and I decided it would be a boy who never existed. His name, I'm sure you guessed, he was brought up by wolves, was Mowgli. It's a question I like asking audiences, and I'm not sure anyone here will be able to rise to the bait. We know that Mowgli uh, was brought up by the she-wolf, and he grew up in the forest. Does anyone here possibly recall what he did when he grew up? You know, when you ask young kids, you uh, meet young kids, you ask, what do you want to do when you grow up? Well, it may interest you to know that when Mowgli grew up, he got a job. Nokri laggai, as they say in Hindi. He also got married. In fact, the first piece of the Jungle Book which was published was called In the Rook, Rook referring to a small grassland inside the forest. And uh, Kipling published this in 1893. He was not yet a best-selling author. He was a great best-selling author. He had not yet won the Nobel Prize. He published this in a magazine. And in the magazine, he starts by saying that of all the departments of the Raj, the most important is the Forest Service. And I'm sure you guessed, Mowgli became a forest guard. And he helped, in Kipling's words, to help the empire to protect the forest. Saplings, Kipling writes, had to be protected so that they were not nibbled by the goats of villagers. They would draw up into these mighty trunks which would supply sleepers, which would build the railways of the Raj. And he said the same railways which brought drain and took goods to be purchased, transported soldiers who would go and crush rebellions. This is in the first two paragraphs of this chapter of the Jungle Book. So I want to remind us that you see in Mowgli's book, just to take this a little further, the evil guy is Sher Khan. 
Sher is Urdu. It's a generic word, sometimes used for the lion, sometimes for the tiger, and misleadingly for both. Sher Khan is also possibly Kipling's typifying of the Muslim landed gentry. In the book, of course, Sher Khan is the baddie. He spends the whole of the book trying to kill and eat up Mowgli, and Mowgli helps with the help of a herd of buffaloes, manages to kill him. But I want to emphasize that when we look at today's environment and ecological landscape, it has been shaped by decisions of the past. And this taking over of this vast area of the forest was an incredible administrative accomplishment of the British Indian Empire. It was also a huge transformation for peoples who depended on the forest. And there was a range. There were people who herded, hunted, did shifting cultivation, gathered, or were simply agriculturists for whom the forest was a catchment area and resource. And when we look, therefore, at the conceptions of the forest today, who will save the cheetah? How will the tiger survive? We are dealing with questions of property. We are dealing with questions of rights, which are a holdover from that long imperial colonial past. But how did India get there? And why, in a talk such as this, did I think of the mid-18th century as a starting point? Well, one answer, of course, is the steam engine. You know, we were all brought up on a certain story, the Industrial Revolution. The Industrial Revolution was a result, this is what the Just So story said, of European ingenuity. Uh, its roots could go back to the scientific progress, technology, the ability to apply machines to what men used to do. And quite rightly, James Watt, I'm sure you will recall, you know, that steam and how that lid went and, the, you know, all these inventions and the spinning jenny and the rise of textiles uh, in, in, in Britain. I'm happy to say, and I, I don't know where her soul is, we had a teacher in school called Mrs. Nazareth who told us, don't believe what's written in your geography history books. She said Lancashire was not a center of uh, the textile industry because the climate was damp. That's not the truth. It was equally damp in many parts of India, like Goa, where I grew up, and Bombay, where I studied. And she rightly told us that Lancashire became a capital because they got cotton from India. They got it cheap. And then they sold the cotton plot there. What Mrs. Nazareth couldn't have told us is what we now know, due to the remarkable work of a scholar such as Prasannan Parthasaradi, who shows that in the early 18th century, there are very important tariff laws brought in which stopped Indian textiles from entering European markets. And he's shown that your Indian textiles also had quite a large market, not only in Europe, but believe it or not, in the Ottoman Empire. Even in the American colonies, which had a lot of slave labor, they were using Indian cotton. So when you think of you know, the cotton uh, fields of uh, southern United States, uh, they were using Indian cotton. This begins to change. And the big change, of course, would not be in the 1720s, but in the 1760s, the taking of the Diwani of Bengal, very important event, uh, with which they got land revenue in the richest part uh, of, uh, of India. Bengal was a flourishing center, not only of very high yields of rice, but also of a range of textiles. And this period of late 18th century sees a collapse of textiles across many parts of India, particularly in the Coromandel Coast. And the land revenue was combined with something else which was very critical in ec ecologically and environmentally, which was the capture of the Indian military labor market. So there were huge numbers of soldiers recruited and deployed, not only in wars of conquest within. So one can make a map, 1760, 1757, Battle of Palashi. You know where the word Palashi comes from? It's Palash, Beauty of Frondosa, the village which was famous for the flame of the forest trees. And of course, the English couldn't say Palashi, they made it Plassey. So it's very interesting. The village of the flame of the forest becomes a very important place of set-piece battles, after which they take control and win land revenue rights over a large province. We could go from there right up to the 1890s, the Battle of Honoma, when they took over the Naga Hills. So in this period, there's this hegemony established. What one tends to forget is that these soldiers were also deployed well beyond India. Just to give an instance, since the place is a lot in the news these days, in 1918, during the course of the Great War, troops from three Indian princely states came across an Ottoman army and fought it in the Battle of Haifa, after which Palestine came under the British mandate with explosive consequences, which are still evident over 100 years later. Indian troops were also deployed in the Battle of the Somme, 1916. So in the Great War, the British were so desperate, by the way, so were the French, that they took soldiers who were non-white, very important, 
train them, put them into uniforms, send them into Europe, and told them to fire at another white man. This is very, very significant in the work that we have on the First World War. I'll cite uh, a former, uh, a very, very distinguished uh, friend, uh, Professor Radhika Singha, who shows uh, what happens because there are so many people working in the labor cause. There were others who worked in uh, uh, Europe itself. They became aware that there was no natural hierarchy in which it's a white man's world. So the same soldiers who come back start asking questions. If we're fighting for freedom, what about our own freedom? But environmentally, it was a very significant battle. The Battle of the Somme was the first time that mustard gas was used in warfare. Uh, my friend Rohit Negi, who teaches in Ambedkar University of Delhi, points out that the air, when it becomes poison, can kill a man. But the air being poisoned, as a result of technological industrial manufacture, this was a first. And the men, they were men, who invented the mustard gas, were to be very important in larger course of environmental history, Haber and Bosch. Haber Bosch worked out the process for the synthesis of ammonia. So all the urea and a lot of the petrochemical fertilizers we use today have their origins there. But to come back to our story, in the course of the 18th and 19th century, India becomes part first of the East India Company polity and then of the British Indian Empire. And in this period, in the early part itself, from the 1780s, 1800s, we find two very interesting features. I'm pulling out anecdotes and particular instances to illustrate a larger point. Within 10 years of the Battle of Palashi in Bengal, the government announces the reward for the killing of tigers. So you killed a tiger and you produced evidence that give you a reward. And this system is taken up by many provinces in some princely states. From the 1870s to 1920s, it was systematized. If you look at the records of the Home Public Department, there is a very interesting set of files, and it says rewards for the killing of dangerous beasts and venomous snakes. Now, when does a beast become dangerous? Why is an animal called a beast? Dangerous to whom? Dangerous for what? Well, there were two kinds of animals. First were animals which destroyed crops. And in the early period, they gave out rewards for animals such as the elephant, the rhinoceros, and the wild buffalo. Over time, this changed. And the rewards which were given for carnivores were made much more systematic. These included the tiger, the leopard, the wolf, the cheetah, the lion. By the 1870s, elephants became important enough to merit protection, first in Madras presidency, then at the All India level. Because rather than being seen as an animal that was dangerous, it now began to be seen as an animal that was useful. And one of the features of Elephus maximus, the Asian elephant, uh, is that the females normally don't have tusks. This is a blessing in disguise, because their cousin, Loxodonta africana, over the last 300 years has been subject to incredible amount of trade in ivory, because the females and the males both have tusks. So if you're a female Asian elephant, you could get away from someone who wanted to kill you from your tusks. But history comes in various ways, one form of good luck, there can be other forms of bad luck. Asian elephants for centuries have been captured, trained, tamed, and used in warfare. <coughs> so the major reason in the 1870s for protecting the Asian elephant was to protect and preserve the numbers so that they could be caught and used for warfare and forestry. They were not under total protection, but there was a fair measure of awareness that if their numbers declined, it would mean a strategic defeat. Here, <coughs> the British were adopting policies and strategies which have been followed by Indian rulers for much longer, going back to the time of the Mauryas. But the other change, the killing of carnivores, would continue right into the 1930s and beyond. The only good tiger was one who was dead. And in a 50-year period, every year, five to 700 tigers were killed for rewards. This is a stunningly large number. You come up with figures like 70, 80,000 tigers being killed. This attempt to push back the wild, conquer the wild, had a human counterpart, which is that peripatetic groups, mobile groups, nomadic groups, were seen as uncivilized, as barbarian, and were to be settled. I don't know how many people over here recall a very famous English author. 
She gave us a completely, completely misleading view of England when we were in school. So much so that I went to England and looked at English food, particularly in my college hall. I discovered that I wouldn't believe a word she had written. Her name was Enid Britton. Now, Enid Britton, if you recall, wrote books on a group called the Famous Five. There was the Famous Five, uh, two lads, two girls, and a dog called Timmy. But the most interesting person in the books was a figure called Joe, J-O Joe. And Joe was a gypsy. Joe could climb up a wall. She could enter a window. And Joe had never had a bath. There's an astonishingly racist uh, section in which Cook takes off Joe kicking and screaming and gives her a bath. And she emerges smelling nice. Not, not the words. So the idea of people who are peripatetic and nomadic as being lawless, brutish, uncivilized, not people like us, was already known in Europe. And the Roma or the Gypsies were singled out for various forms of prejudice and discrimination in a long uh, saga in European history, culminating in the attempt to exterminate them, which is a very important, not very well remembered part of the tragedy of the Holocaust. Along with the Jews, the Roma also were persecuted by the Nazis. But on a much larger scale, not extermination, but certainly forcible sedentarization was something seriously pursued by the British. There were, of course, groups who did want to sedentarize, but the key thing is sedentarizing people and settling them was seen as civilizing, both for law and order, as well as material reasons. So with the Bheels, for instance, in Khandesh, if they settled in a place, it was possible to count the number of men and recruit them for the forge. It was also possible to count how much land they had and assess them for revenue. This led to much more Amusing encounters. Uh, in my own work, I was struck by the group of the Baigas, who were in Mandla and Balaghat, who met a man called Colonel Ward. Colonel Ward had participated in 1857-58. He had roamed around on horseback fighting mutineers and others. He had even raised a group of Baigas who served in a detachment. But in the 1870s, Colonel Ward decided that enough of their Sweden cultivation, they should all settle down. So he got onto a horse and went up to a hilltop where they lived and negotiated with them. The Baigas were much cleverer than Ward expected. They said, we're completely willing to settle down. We'll give up our bevar cultivation, but we have a condition. We don't know how to do plough cultivation. The best person to teach us plough cultivation is you, sir. And in order to enable your settlement, we will provide you four Baiga wives. They will look after you, and while you live with us, we will take up plough cultivation. So this was, of course, rejected by Ward because he could not possibly disobey the civil service rules which forbade polygamy, and he didn't want to live there with Baiga wives. And I think this is a tongue-in-cheek way of them telling him that, that they didn't want to have anything to do with this. But in the succeeding decades, the Baigas would come under enormous stress. For instance, they were taxed. How do you tax people who don't have a fixed place of cultivation? You can't measure how much they're cultivating. They shift their plot every few years. You can't measure the output because the crop may vary from year to year and what they are extracting. You can't even just measure their crop because besides cropping land, they do hunting and wage work. Well, one of the interesting things of the British is that there were very few of them. The other interesting thing is they gathered a lot of information and they hit upon a device. They counted the number of axes and they taxed the axes. In areas that had important timber trees like the Sal, you paid the princely sum, this is a large sum at that time, of two rupees per year. Where there was no Sal, it was one rupee a year. So there's a mix of incentives and disincentives in which the forest is remade. When we go back to Kipling, Kipling lionizes those trees which provide timber. And when you look at the large body of work of Indian forestry going from the 1860s to the present, including our good friends Sir Harry Champion and S.K. Set, it prioritizes those trees which provide timber and are commercially valuable. It doesn't include very important trees in terms of livelihood, which I were to recount even three, four, any of you would recognize. Think of Diasporus mel melanoxylon, the tendu or the kendu, very important for the bidi. You know the bidi? It's rolled in leaves. That's collected by women, mostly Adivasi, scheduled tribe. They go into the forest and collect it. They measure how many leaves and they pay them. It's a very <coughs> politically volatile issue. Journalists for years have called it the leaf that makes governments fall. You know, in the recent elections, Madhya Pradesh, Rajasthan, 
Chhattisgarh is a very important question. What is the rate of the Tendu Patta? It could be a tree like the Mahua, which provides food. It also is very important for liquor. I could give many other species. So this idea of looking at a forest and asking what makes it valuable favored certain species, it disfavored others. At times, this could change dramatically. Before the 1920s, bamboo was not used for paper pulp. In the 1920s, a very bright young man worked out how to use bamboo for paper pulp. Bamboo, which was declared a weed in earlier forest plants, suddenly became a valuable species of grass. So the contest over nature has reshaped the land. It's reshaped its animals, it's reshaped its plants, it's reshaped its peoples. It's not all one way, and I think one should be conscious that certainly in the early 20th century, there were intimations of an idea which we are very familiar with, extinction. It's a very interesting idea that a species could become extinct. It's a new idea. It was first thought of by a Frenchman, like many other things in life, uh, George Cuvier. He coined this term in the 1790s. And by the early 20th century, British officials in India and some of the princes were aware that there was a creature called the quagga, which is actually it's a subspecies of zebra, but they thought it's a different species, being wiped out in South Africa. They read in literature about the American bison, which had to be protected. You know, the huge millions of herds of bison had shrunk to a few hundred, and there were major efforts to protect them, led by Vice President of the United States, Teddy Roosevelt. It's around this time we find very interesting protective measures begun to be taken in India. The lions of the Gir Forest around 1900, even earlier, the Nawab of Junagadh started controlling who could hunt lions and he started giving permits for hunting lions. Very few were killed. There's equally interesting efforts with the rhinoceros, which once had a vast range. I mean, many people here would be familiar with the Harappan civilization seal of an enormous greater one-horned rhinoceros. And in 1900s, there's an area now known as Kaziranga, which begins to be protected as a game reserve because the number of rhinos had declined and the areas which they lived had been cleared and were to be cleared on much larger scale for rice paddies. The 1930s, of course, are also a time when there are other changes afoot. There's a new generation of Indian leaders who's debating what will be the nature of freedom. Now, the nature of freedom is a very large debate. It, you know, what does it mean in political terms, social terms, economic terms, cultural terms, if you want to be free from what? If you want to be for what purpose? If you want to be free for whom? What should be the priority given to social reform as opposed to political independence? Is there to be a mix? How are they to be matched? To me, what is interesting is that in India of the 20s and 30s and 40s, there's a very interesting debate on alternative ways and different models of development. This is not the term used by them. It's a term being used by me. But to illustrate, one of the very interesting ideas, of course, goes back to Gandhiji's famous book, written in 1909. He was a very capable man. He could do something I bet most of you can't. He could write both with his right and his left hand. And the ideas were flowing so fast in his mind on the ship that he wrote with his right hand. When it ached, he wrote with the left hand. His uh, script, and forgive me for saying this, it's close to blasphemy. If you go to the Gandhi Heritage Portal, it's indecipherable. It's very difficult to read in any language. It's written in a great hurry. He was a lawyer. But this is a very profound book, Hind Swaraj, because it rejected the benefits of modern civilization. He questioned many things which his generation of Indians, educated in the ways of the Raj, saw as the benevolence of the British, railways, modern medicine, hospitals, English learning. He argued there is a different kind of ethos in India and he lionized, as we all know, and would come to over the next 20 odd years. By 1919, 20s emerged as the former spokesperson of the Congress, the leader of Indian nationalism. He saw a world of hand spun, hand woven cloth, of decentralization, of interdependence in the village. It's very difficult to teach this to students, so I decided to recruit one of the alumni of my school. My school is famous for its alumni, none as famous as this one, I'm sure you've guessed who, Shah Rukh Khan, who has a very interesting film called Swaraj, which has a fascinating song called Ye Tara, Wo Tara, Wo Tara, which actually 
is an evocation of the different professions and crafts in a village and how they are interdependent. In the film, of course, Shah Rukh Khan is a Gandhi-like figure, though most unlike him in his behavior. He sings, prances, and dances around and tries to bring people together for the noble cause of education of the poor. But this idea of interdependence is something which is deeply Gandhian. And this is something which for Gandhi, the village would not just be a place of residence, it would embody a certain sense of community. Uh, there's a big question of how historical or his, ahistorical it was. Many scholars have pointed out that Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi, like many others of his ilk, was actually drawing on British writers such as Henry Maine, who were idealizing the village community. And as you all know, one of his great critics famously said that the village is not just, it's not a community, it's a sink of ignorance. And this was, of course, Ambedkar, who went on to point out that many people who idolize the village have never lived in one. They're not even conscious that the village is not one community, but many. Leave the big debates on hierarchy, ranking, and caste out. Think only of the relation to resources. Mahatma Gandhi would be very important because of the Dandi March, lionized. He sets off with 78 people, walks along the Mahi River, goes to the beach, and makes salt. This is an assertion of common property. By making salt, he was arguing that the coast and the sea waters belong to all Indians, irrespective of caste, community, or rank. What a beautiful way to emphasize the idea of freedom. All you had to do was go to the coast and make salt. It's a different matter. You could be beaten brutally and jailed for it, and you would be willing to do so in public. This is very interesting. So what, a, what, a, what an original way of protest. In areas where there was no sea, and large, vast parts of India are hinterland, the late David Baker wrote a superb paper called The Dangerous Time, the forest satyagraha in the central provinces. So in the central provinces, Congress leaders like Ravi Shankar Shukla and others led groups into the forest. They shouted Mahatma Gandhi ki jai, and they proceeded in what they call the forest satyagraha. Instead of making salt, they chopped down trees. There was then a division between people like Shukla ji, D.P. Mishra and others, future prime ministers, chief ministers of central provinces, who said, we'll only cut a few trees symbolically and go home. The Bheel, Skorkus, and Bilala said, no, we are not interested in symbol. This forest was ours, we're reclaiming it. Not only are we cutting the trees, we're going to stay over here. So there are big divisions on what you mean by community. Is this to be something symbolic? Or is it to be a community of equals? And Ambedkar, of course, in his own way, in the Mahat Satyagraha 1927, asserted, that the depressed classes had the right to equal access to water. This is the remaking of the environment. It's a non-violent protest. It's a very difficult protest. And here, the violence would come not from British overlords, but from their uh, peers and contemporaries who regarded themselves as the twice mob. But the big debate was not about this. The big debate was, what would India do with the accoutrements of modern civilization? And we all know what happens. In 1938, as president of the Indian National Congress, Subhash Bos appointed his partner, brother, friend, future adversary Jawaharlal Nehru as head of the National Planning Committee. And the outline that is given here is of an India that would be independent with a modern economic infrastructure. So the artifices of economic growth were seen as vital to protect independence, to safeguard freedom. It's easy to see this with the benefit of hindsight. We shouldn't forget that in 1936, Jawaharlal Nehru was one of the few people who visited the Republican fighters in Spain. He visited a place rendered famous by Picasso, El Guernica, which was bombed by the Condor Legion, supplied by the Fuhrer and his good friend Benito Mussolini, the dictator of Italy, to help the Republicans. So it was very evident what would be the use of independence, however brave you were, if you didn't have the means to defend it. And the reference here is not to aircraft or weapons of war. It is to the artifices of a modern economy. The production of power, steel and iron, chemical fertilizer. Remember our friends, Haber, Bosch and Urea. These would become very critical in India that emerged after independence. And I think that from the 30s to the 60s, particularly from the time of the Second World War. There was a large Gromo food campaign. British changed their own rules, which prevented Indians from having firearms. They gave out firearms to cultivators to shoot wild boars, nilgai, sambar, and chital, which invaded the fields. And this, in independent India, became the campaign to grow more food. 
very great Indian nationalist labor leader who became vice president of India, very controversial and tough election, became president of India, Varaha Venkatagiri, wrote a wonderful pamphlet in the 1940s where he said, when India becomes independent, we'll bring the entire landscape under cultivation. And there's a very important book written by a geographer who said, you can't bring the entire land under cultivation. The areas which are desert, the areas which are arid, the areas which are dry, the areas which are mountains, the areas which are salt marsh. But this notion that you could bring nature under the heel was very important, not only in India, but in several newly independent countries across the world. You see this in the buildings of the dams of Bakra, Nangal, Nagarjuna Sagara, Tungabhadra. You see it in the use of DDT to kill off the malarial mosquitoes and open up the great Tarai swamps. DDT was also be important in the opening up of the Diptera forests of the Western Ghats. At this time, pulp and paper wood industries were given huge subsidies because production of paper per capita, paper per capita, was a measure of progress. If you had a literate population, they'd need school textbooks at the least. And for that, you needed to transform pulp, uh, the hardwood trees and bamboo into paper. So there is reason to believe that much of this was to do with the idea that without this basic core of modern heavy industry, it would be difficult for India to maintain its political independence. I say this because India stands in contrast with several other developing countries. It had the advantage of some minimal industrial base during the imperial period, unlike much of Africa, barring South Africa. It had the advantage of an educated labor force. One could go back, you could look at Ginde Engineering College, 1794, Hindu College, Bengal, 1817, and so on and so forth. But it also had the ability to try and manage some of these changes. So despite this larger headlong rush of the conquest of nature, we find in the 50s a lot of debate about how to conserve the natural heritage. Uh, there's national parks created, sanctuaries set up. There's a big debate about Adivasi cultures and tribals, and there's an attempt to have cultural policies which give them the benefits of modern civilization without destroying their genius and their particular views of culture. I think this period comes to an end in the late 60s. And in the late 60s, there's a series of crises that led to this. One of them was that the monsoon failed twice. India was despite its considerable progress over 20 years of independence, forced into a situation where in just two years, it imported around 19, 20 million tons of grain from the United States. Shankar's Weekly, very great son of Kerala, had this remarkable poster of a huge corpulent looking American with an Indian with a begging bowl wearing the turban, a shirtless Indian. It's a very pathetic thing. And the American is saying, little Tommy Tucker, will you please sing for your supper? This 19 million tons of grain had to be purchased by a country which did not have the foreign exchange to pay for it. So there was the public law 480. India entered into a series of debts with the United States. This would bring to a head a series of changes which we now know as the Green Revolution. And there's a lot of debate and controversy around the Green Revolution. But there are three kinds of changes it brought which have reshaped our larger polity in very significant ways. One is that there was a shift around this time to high yielding varieties. So these were short varieties, particularly of wheat, also of rice, which were grown in certain parts of India. They matured faster, enabling double cropping. They gave higher amount of grain per plant. They raised the income of the cultivators. In order to accomplish this, they needed a lot of water. They needed petrochemical inputs in the form of fertilizers and pesticides, which government subsidized. And this was enabled by two transformations, which are fundamental ecological shifts. They are so fundamental that we take them for granted. You know, if you see old films, I was just uh, looking at an old film of Dilip Kumar, you know, great Yusuf Khan, and he's uh, singing a song, and he's riding a cart. Now, he spends more time singing the song than whipping the bulls, but obviously they knew where to go. If you think of that India, it existed till the end of the 60s. In this span of less than 50 years, in a country where 70, 80% of draft power came from bulls, bullocks, and buffaloes, it now comes from tractors. This is a fundamental shift in terms of the forms of 
the shift from muscle power or if you like brawn power, bovine brawn power, to petrochemical energy or fossil fuel energy. Related to this is another change. Through history, because of the nature of the monsoon, whether you have a clearly defined wet and a much longer dry season, some parts of India are blessed, the extreme tip of South India, parts of Tamil Nadu, Andhra, Kerala, we get two monsoons, southwest, northeast. Most of India is only one monsoon. There are also other shorter wet spells. But most of the rain comes in about 100 days of the year. Therefore, irrigation of crops has rested on surface water, rivers, canals, lakes, ponds, and groundwater, wells. Well, in the 1960s came a huge transformation, the tube well, the bore well. You could now bore the tube down into the substrate and pull water out from 100, 200, 400, 500, or more than 500 meters. 60, 65% of India today, the irrigation comes from groundwater. All of this has an, a, a, a flip side. One of the important things about petrochemical products, whether fertilizer or pesticide, is that they don't get all absorbed in the plant. They stay in the atmosphere. Everything is interconnected, as Barry Commoner would write in his famous book in 1972. Everything goes somewhere. There's no such thing as waste. The fertilizer leaches into the groundwater. The pesticide works its way up the food chain. It has huge consequences. I refer to tube well water, and all of you are aware what the impact of bore wells is in vast areas. Interestingly, I don't know, I am quite struck by the three countries with different political systems, United States, India, China, most of the landmass, groundwater tables are being depleted much faster than being, they are being replenished. There's some evidence recently that government policies in India have reversed that. The rate of recharge has gone up. But that's a small step in the other direction. I think in the late 19, uh, 20, 20th century, there is another set of changes. With liberalization, some of the executive policies, legislative measures that were undertaken in, in the late 60s, 70s, 80s, tended to get weakened. So interestingly, around the time of the Green Revolution, there is a fresh awareness about how the instability of a climate, particularly of the monsoon, cannot simply be countered with better technology. It needs other sorts of changes. You had the Wildlife Protection Act 1972, Forest Conservation Act 1980, the launch of Project Tiger in 73, vast expansion of protected areas and parks and sanctuaries, and a series of measures in which India attempts to balance the issue of the development with the environment. They're not all successful, but they're there. And I think in the late 90s, there is a shift. Unlike in the 1930s, people of whatever political constituency, left, right, or center, had seen government or states as driving growth. By the 90s, the government or the states were seen as important for facilitating growth. The job of government was to facilitate private investment. Private investment would now be seen as the driver. At what cost? There's a big debate about this, whether it's left, right, whether labor benefits or capital. But let's step a little away from that and ask, what is the impact of this on the biophysical environment, on the material flows in the environment? And here is the dilemma on which I land. India's has been a remarkable journey in this period of 1750 to 2000. From a large subcontinent with many polities to being brought under the rule of the British Indian Empire, then its emergence, first as a dominion, then an independent republic. This has largely been a successful story. Like all successes, it's had its twists, turns, ups, downs. The nature of its economic, political, cultural record is very well known to all of you. And there are as many opinions among Indians as there are Indians. There will always be debate and long may it live. When we look at its environmental record, one can argue that it's a mixed one. One way to look at it is simply to say that it's a story of degradation, loss, disrepair, and defeat. You could do what my biologist friends do. You know, you plot the range of the rhinoceros 200 years ago, 500 years ago. I'm always uh, astonished people are very interested in what Babur did or did not do in India. What to me is most interesting is that in the 1520s, he went for a hunt for the rhinoceros near Peshawar. 
he went with his khans and begs into an area and hunted rhinoceros. It's a very difficult hunt. He'd never seen anything like a rhinoceros. Here was this large animal which could run as fast as a horse. It can. Don't try out running a rhino. It'll beat you. It's not fat. It's just, it's all muzzle. And it's done it without steroids. And what the rhinoceros did, he said, was with its horn, it attacked the horse and the horse fell down and so did the rider. So, so Babar is, his, his account of the rhinoceros is one of wonder. There are no rhinos anywhere near Peshawar today. The closest rhinos are in Dudwa, in parts of Nepal, Bhutan, West Bengal, and of course, large, largest number in Assam, where they are protected in reserves. But the other way to see it is to see not just the degradation of ecosystems, the deterioration of ecologies, the loss of forest, the vanishing of grassland, overfishing, chemical contamination of soil, air, water, but also look at ways in which environmental repair, restoration, protection can happen. And one of the fascinating things about India is that there are many environments here where humans have existed not for decades, not for centuries, but for millennia. How have these societies, states, replenished the environment, kept it as a space that is habitable, safe, and biologically productive? This, to me, is as significant as the other stories. There's a big debate, as I said, in history about above and below. Well, it has its counterpart on the environment. There are people who believe in authoritarian means of environmental control. And this school of thought had a lot of support in India during the emergency, when for the first and only time, there was an attempt to cut the rate of population growth through forcible means. You know, the rate of population growth in India started going up in the 1920s. It peaks in the 80s and then goes down. And the remarkable story is that India and China get to net replacement ratio roughly around the same time, but India did it without the coercive means China used. There were other transformations, and it is opposite that I say this in Kerala, which was the first society to get in, South, in, in India to get to net replacement ratio. It, it had to do with social changes, the, the dignity, freedom, position of women in society, access to education, changing forms of labor, and so on and so forth. But the other debate is whether one can have environmental restoration, protection, preservation, not from above, but by drawing on and tapping different forms of knowledge from groups that have historically been subordinated. And there is a huge number of initiatives. We just have a remarkable memoir just been published in English. The Hindi version is much longer, called Gentle Resistance by Chandi Prasad Bhatt of the Chipko movement. And there is a range of such initiatives which have been a very important corrective to this idea that this has to be done from above. But the reality is that whether one believes in reform from above or reform from below, whether one believes in radical transformation or step-by-step -step incremental progress, we are at a crossroads of history. Two reasons for this. Today, the ability to render the environment unlivable, unhealthy, unsafe, is much greater than the pace of repair, restoration, and rendering it healthy. The power to do this is unequally distributed. There are some people who exercise more power and others who exercise less. But, this is the catch, unless efforts in environmental repair address livelihood issues, the effort of huge numbers of people to attain maintain and improve a life of material dignity, it's bound to fail. So this question of how do we reconcile the quest for dignity and equality with spaces for nature, not just in the abstract, home for the tiger, let's save the dolphin, uh, protect the gangetic gavial, all that is very important. But in terms of having a larger livable, productive, safe, habitable environment is a question that history poses to us. So we may have many views of India's environmental past, it's a past with many layers, many histories, and in many ways it speaks to us to act with responsibility, with restraint, with some degree of knowledge, and perhaps more humility than we have often displayed. Thank you. Very nice. So I would like to um, say a big thank you from the Madhvanaya Foundation, the Kerala Museum. Um, thank you from the journal team. Um, and thank you to you all, especially um, for coming out, braving the traffic around Lulu Mall uh, and reaching here on Saturday afternoon. 
Um, hopefully, some of you will join us tomorrow also. Um, and uh, so this topic, although uh, much broader than our usual Kerala scope, um, relates to many of our uh, exhibitions on the journal uh, archive. And I think especially the ones connected to land and environment, um, you'll be able to connect with what uh, Professor Angarajan has said today also, with the larger context. And um, from Adivasi, uh, you know, fights to eventually Tina's going to have one on land tenure to, uh, you know, when we talk about even uh, cultural art forms in Kannur, where land ownership is such a, uh, you know, the, the holdings were so huge before they were broken down into smaller sections, uh, all come back to this topic of environmental history that we're looking at, actually. Um, so it's, it's fair to say that many of our general talks have centered around uh, environmental history because it's been such an important part of our, the last uh, 200 years. So I'd like to say a big thank you thank for coming and uh, delivering this lecture. Um, I also want to make special mention of uh, our curator and editor, a storyteller and oral historian who has um, you know, been overseeing the creation of the journal articles and the research and even the way we poke around different subjects. And his name is Surajit Sarkar. He's not here with us today, he's in Delhi. Um, but much of the, when you go through the journal articles, you'll actually see uh, uh, how it, and why it's not linear and why the story is being told from various you know possible points of view um, so that it's not really a one-sided story anymore but maybe you can start asking questions at least around you know different other perspectives of that topic um, so a lot of credit goes to his very um, uh, you know not not a mainstream approach and and that's also because he has been oral historian he set up the uh, the Center for community knowledge in in uh, the Ambedkar University, and he's also a good friend of uh, uh, <laughs> Professor Rangarajan. So, uh, so uh, you know, to look at history like uh, Professor Rangarajan said, with oral histories and with other perspectives, not only looking at one storyline. Um, this is something we've tried to do, and we'd love to hear your feedback. So please, when we share the articles and the exhibitions, do get back to us with, um, and we have prizes for book. We, we have book prizes for people who uh, who respond. The first three people who respond to our surveys will receive prizes. So please, uh, you know, hit your uh, read button, read more button, and read through. Some of them are longer, some of them are shorter. We'd love to know even the length, the content, and all of that, what you think. Um, so uh, we'll close the lecture for today. Uh, and then uh, if you're up for a few more questions, there's a lot of people who have some more questions. So thank you all for coming and hope to see you all tomorrow.